एवरीवन, आई एम श्रद्धा भुरकुंडे एंड आई एम अ साइंस कम्युनिकेटर एट आई सपोदे आर एक्सप्लोरेशन टू अंडरस्टैंड मैटर इज अ जर्नी ओवर सेंचुरीज एंड इज स्टिल ऑन गोइंग यू मस्ट हैव कम अक्रॉस टर्म्स लाइक न्यूट्रीनो गॉड पार्टिकल लार्ज एड्रॉन कोलाइडर एंड सो ऑन सो लेट्स टॉक टू अ पार्टिकल फिजिसिस्ट एंड इंक्वायर अबाउट दिस क्यूरियोसिटीज फर्दर हाई सौरभ थैंक यू फॉर ज्वाइनिंग अस टूडे could you tell us what is particle physics and how does it correlate to our understanding of matter so particle physics is a interesting field the aim of particle physics is to try to understand what our world is made up of so as you've heard from sessions before this most of the times you know traditionally we thought that uh, everything around us was made of the five elements air earth wind fire and so on and then we learned a little bit more we did a few more experiments we learned that stuff is made of atoms we have a nice little periodic table that tells us the different kinds of atoms if we keep digging towards smaller and smaller pieces if we break apart an atom an atom is made of a nucleus and other particles and then the nucleus you break apart is made of protons and neutrons and the protons you break apart and so on so we can keep doing this today what we think is that the universe is made up of these fundamental particles these fundamental particles are organized into different different sections depending on the different different colors you can tell that so some of these consist of matter particles in other words stuff around us is made of these and some of these are gauge bosons so these gauge bosons are the particles that inter- that help other particles interact with each other so these can be thought of like the languages with which the matter particles talk to each other everybody has heard of these forces so the forces are the electromagnetic force the strong nuclear force the weak nuclear force everybody has also heard of gravity but gravity is so weak that it doesn't play any role in what particle physics is so what is particle physics there are two answers to this particle physics aims to understand what the world around us is made up of and how do these fundamental particles interact with each other so these are the goals of particle physics any study that tries to uncover this is particle physics so would it be right to say that this periodic table of particle physics does not explain gravity That's right. So gravity is an unanswered question of the standard model. It is so weak that so far we have ideas about how to explain gravity, but it doesn't form uh, any part of the standard model of particle physics. I'm assuming that along with gravity there might be other unsolved problems which are not addressed in the table. Can you elaborate on it? Well, the standard model of particle physics is exceptionally successful. It's actually one of the best tested theories of mankind. Like we have tested it up to 8 decimal places in certain quantities. Nevertheless there are a few things that the standard model just doesn't address so i'm going to talk about a couple of examples one example is we have experimental evidence that something called dark matter exists in our universe in fact 24% of the entire universe is dark matter 70 odd percent is dark energy and only 4% is the regular stuff that we see around us the primarily uh, experimental evidence for dark matter is in terms of rotation curves of galaxies so if you measure the velocity of stars as you go away from the center of a galaxy you expect this velocity to decrease but it turns out that this stays constant so that was the first sign that you know something is amiss today we have a lot more concrete evidence in terms of gravitational lensing so this tells us that galaxies have a lot of stuff in it that is just not visible it's not your regular luminous matter stars and so on it's dark matter now what this dark matter is made up of is obviously a question for particle physics Right. So, since particle physics tries to explain what everything in our universe is made up of, we certainly would like to know what 24% of our universe is made of. So, there is visible matter, there is dark matter, and then there is dark energy. Does particle physics address both dark matter and dark energy? So, not dark energy. Dark energy is more of a cosmological. I mean, so cosmology is the field that would address what dark energy is. Dark matter, on the other hand, since it's matter. we expect that it's some kind of a particle if it's some kind of a particle then we expect particle physics to be able to say something about what it is to be completely honest it doesn't even have to be just one particle dark matter itself can consist of many many particles the way regular matter consists of many many particles what are these different subatomic particles which are different from the traditional atomic model traditionally everything is made up of protons and electrons As I change the number of protons, we all know that is what the periodic table is. I start with hydrogen, helium, lithium, and so on. A proton is made up of two kinds of quarks: an up quark and a down quark. If I put two up and one down, then I get a proton. 
If I take one up and two down, I get a neutron. Now, like these up and down quarks, there are also other quarks called charm, strange, top, and bottom. When I include strange quarks into the mix, I get particles such as kaons. Um, then there are B mesons that include the B quark. With electrons uh, and, and electron neutrinos, there are other particles such as the muon and, and the tau lepton. One of the things is that all of these heavier particles, they are unstable. They immediately decay down to the first generation. So if you start with the second generation, then you all of these particles are going to subsequently decay down to the first generation. So this means that whatever you're going to observe in the universe is always going to be eventually just the first generation. In our experiments or in high energy astrophysical phenomena such as you know centers of stars and whatnot, in these high energy environments you're going to produce these heavier particles but as soon as they're produced they're going to very quickly decay down to the first generation. So ultimately what you observe is just from the first generation which is up, down, electron and the electron neutrino. So everything that you know around you like protons, neutrons, Thus, all of the atoms, everything is just made from the first generation. So we often hear and read about God particle. Where does it fit in the periodic table? The story goes in the following way. Uh, Leon Lederman, who is a Nobel Prize winner who was the director of Fermilab, uh, wrote a book about the Higgs boson. The reason to write this book was that the Higgs boson was proposed way back in the 60s and for many years people were looking for it at different, different experiments. There was a lot of indirect evidence that something like the Higgs must exist but nobody could ever find it. This is why there was a lot of literature, there were a lot of books and Leon Lederman uh, thought outreach was fairly important so he wrote a book to try to explain what this particle is. Because it was so frustrating and it was not found, he wanted to call his book the goddamn particle. His editor, who was a fairly religious person, thought that if the book is called the goddamn particle, it won't really sell and the editor proposed to him to rename the book as the god particle. That's where the Higgs boson gets his name, the God particle. In reality, it is no more or less important than some of the other particles that we have. The Higgs does give mass to the rest of the particles, but I wouldn't think that necessarily mass is a more important property than charge, for example. The fact that an electron is charged one way and the proton is charged the other way gives rise to the binding between electron and proton, gives rise to atoms and thus all of chemistry and biology. So of course, the electromagnetic interaction is the most important one for us as humans. The Higgs boson, or the God particle, is the reason why all of the other particles in the standard model get mass. So when they interact with the Higgs field, that's how they get mass. This is why the Higgs boson has captured a lot of imagination, also because it is amongst the most recent particles to be found in 2012. And so given the long history of searching for the Higgs, that is also why it has captured more imagination than the other particles, which maybe we'll found a bit sooner. So was Higgs the only prediction made? Some particles tend to be found before they are predicted and then you have to sort of insert them in your theory. You have to explain, okay, okay, now I found something, how do I go about and explain it? The Higgs on the other hand was a proposal that turned out to be true. Now, it wasn't the only proposal. At the time when the Higgs was proposed, there were a few other things that were also proposed uh, to try to explain the masses of particles. It just turned out that the Higgs was the correct explanation. So I would like to draw parallels between the periodic table in chemistry and the one in particle physics. Both tables admitted the idea of missing links. Yes, it is true that you have gaps, you would have gaps in the periodic table of particle physics that you would try to fill. Of course, the periodic table of particle physics is a much smaller thing than our you know, periodic table of elements. So here, what you, what you, the way you would fill in these holes was that you would go out and observe manifestations of particles. So you go out and observe, say, a kaon, or you observe a upsilon uh, meson, or you observe a jsi meson, which leads you to believe that there is an additional quark or there is additional phenomena, as opposed to uh, actually going out and observing the quark. So in other words, you have evidence of that object, the quark, existing in some other states. So the example for this would be that you know, uh, all atoms tend to be made of protons and neutrons. So it's kind of difficult to give the same analogy. But nevertheless, suppose you had iron and you had uranium. And uh, if you had observed, say, molecules involving uranium, but you didn't actually know uranium existed. So what you would do is you have this, you know, long sort of a polymer or some sort of a large molecule that had uranium in there. And you would be like, okay, this thing doesn't really make sense unless there is an atom of uranium existing. So that would be a prediction for uranium then you'd go out and observe it. Of course, in chemistry, that's not how it came about, but here certainly 
that's sort of what happened. You looked at the bound states, you saw what their properties were, and that caused you to predict that oh, if this part since this particle exists, underlying it there must be a quark with these properties. In our conversation so far, we mentioned observation, prediction, and analysis of data. But what are our tools to do these experiments? In the modern world, we do two kinds of particle physics experiments. The first experiment is when we try to produce new particles in the lab. And the second kind of experiment is where we have detectors that aim to detect cosmic particles. So, you know, neutrinos or dark matter particles that are all around us in space and we try to detect them on Earth. The first kind, which is the lab experiment, the easiest or the most powerful way to sort of do this is with colliders. So in a collider, you have a beam going one way, you have another beam going the other way, and you have these two beams go at high energy and bang into each other. Now everybody knows Einstein's relation E equals mc square. Effectively what this means is that given a certain amount of E, a certain amount of energy of the collision, you can produce particles with a mass corresponding to that energy. So if I collide something at say 100 GeV, some units, then I'll be able to produce a massive particle with a mass of 100 GeV. If I collide something at 500 GeV, then I'll be able to produce 500 GeV. So now this means that if I want to produce heavier and heavier, so more and more massive particles, I need to collide things at higher and higher energies. The LHC is the world's highest energy collider right now. Is that the Large Hadron Collider? Correct. So why is it called the Large Hadron Collider? It turns out that for most of the year, the LHC will collide protons with protons, so proton-proton beam, and protons are hadrons. But for a very short time of the year, like a couple of weeks, the LHC will also collide lead ions and lead ions, or a proton with a lead ion. So the lead-lead collisions tell us something else about particle physics, and the proton-proton collisions tell us something else. The, the Most of the stuff happens with the proton-proton collisions. That, that's more general, tries to address a lot of things. The challenge of building the LHC is that if you want uh, to accelerate particles to a very, very high energy, charged particles, when you tend to accelerate or decelerate them, they radiate energy. So if I have a circular collider, then particles as they are moving in a circle are going to radiate away their energy. This is called as Bremsstrahlung. Now, this is not very nice, right? You put in energy to accelerate the particle, but the particle radiates away that energy. So, you know, you don't really like that. This is the reason why the LHC is L. It's large. If you make it large, then the amount of bending is small, right? So, so it's like a gentle curve. Like, like a small part of a large circle almost appears to be a straight line. Exactly, it's almost like a straight line. So, so that helps in reducing the amount of radiation that it's going to waste. Um, the other thing about the LHC was that the LHC is built in the same tunnel as a previous collider there, which was the LEP, the Large Electron Positron Collider. It turns out that almost half the cost of building a new collider comes from making the tunnel. So by placing the LHC in the LEP tunnel, you know, we could be very frugal and try to sort of use the same sort of things again. Why is this detector so complicated? So, I really like this analogy. Think of an object, a 3D object, you know, say your favorite pet, you have a cat at home. So, you know, take a picture of the cat with your camera. Now, if you print out this picture and you look at it, what you actually have is a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional object. Now, you look at this picture and very obviously you recognize that, hey, that's my cat. In reality, the amount of processing that your brain has done here is phenomenal. So let me give you one example. Suppose you take a picture of your cat during the day or during the night. The picture is going to look pretty different. Nevertheless, you have no problem recognizing your cat. Imagine I take a picture and show it to you on my phone, which is this small, or I make a big poster sized picture. You still recognize that it's your cat. In other words, somehow your brain already understands that size doesn't matter, the background light doesn't matter and so on. It focuses on the right things. The two dimensional representation is also good at allowing you to sort of judge scale and size and these things. If I showed you a picture of an elephant, your brain knows enough information from beforehand to understand that this looks like a fairly massive object. If I show you a feather, your brain, based on its history and what it has learned about life, tells it, oh, this looks like a light object. With particle physics, we don't have that option. We have to do everything right then and there. So this means that the detector has to be pretty complicated because of all the different kinds of particles. There are only a few of them that are stable enough for us to detect. We need to be able to unambiguously detect what those are. We can't afford to be confused, say, between a photon and an electron, or between a muon and a kaon, and so on. So, to do all of these things, we build a detector from various subcomponents. Each of these subcomponents is designed with a specific purpose in mind. Each of it acts towards one specific goal. 
and by putting together the information from all of these different sub detectors we are able to construct a picture of what the event is what would you call this kind of experiment a multivariable problem perhaps so the right way to describe it is that cms or atlas for that matter is called as a multi purpose detector as opposed to you know a dark matter or neutrino experiment which are very very specific let me take you through some of the different pieces of the cms detector the detector is kind of like an onion so it has layers no kind of like shrink um, so the detector has layers like an onion the collision happens in the center which would be somewhere here as you go away from the center first there is a detector that detects charged particles so anything that has a charge you detect the path of that particle and you detect its charge so you kind of see you know how and what direction it's going in after this charged particle detector you have something called calorimeters these calorimeters measure the total energy of the particle now in particle physics one of the most important things that you can do to measure for a particle is measure its four vector so four vector means you measure its energy and you measure its momentum in the three space coordinates so px py and pz so to measure this four vector what you have is that the tracker measures the momentum so the direction and the path so you got the vector and the calorimeter measures the energy and now you've got on the full four vector of the particle this really works well for things like electrons photons on the other hand are not charged particles so obviously they don't leave a signature in the tracker but they just show up in the calorimeter so now what you can do is you can compare an electron and a photon if i see a charged particle pointing to something in the calorimeter that is an electron if there is nothing pointing to a, a deposit in the calorimeter that would be a photon because a photon is not going to give you a signal the other sort of particle that cms detects very effectively is muons muons because they are heavier than electrons don't actually behave in the same way as electrons and photons these muons will just go straight through the detector so what you do is you have this tracker then you have the calorimeter you stick another tracker at the outside so what this means is that as the muon goes out it interacts with the tracker it's charged so you see a path then you see nothing and you see another path in the muon chambers So now when you see a path in the chambers outside and the path inside you match them up this tells you that it was a muon so this is why the detector has to be pretty complicated you have these different different sub pieces you put together the information from all of these cms has a wonderful algorithm called particle flow so this is written in the software so this particle flow algorithm helps to take all of the different sub detectors take all of their information and from there classify particles into electrons photons hadrons muons and so on I see a date on the top corner. What is the significance of the date? This is an actual collision event. This was recorded on Monday, August the 6th, 2018. This is a very interesting collision because in this collision we produced one electron, one muon and one tau lepton along with evidence of some quarks. So it's kind of interesting to have all three kinds of leptons represented in the same event. It's pretty rare. This gives you an example of what I was talking about. an electron has this track that points to it with a calorimeter deposit a muon has no deposit it goes all the way out to the muon chambers the tau for example in this case has decayed into hadron so it has a slightly different signature so this is what you see when you actually observe a single collision now you have to actually look at many 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 collisions so you know scientists at cms will look at millions and billions of these collisions to draw statistical inferences about a whether we found new particles or uh, measuring the properties of existing particles and to try to say something about the universe that we live in so sort of v as an isopune is a member of the cms what is our role in it so isopune has been a member of cms in 2014 There are two scientists here who work on CMS. Uh, there is Professor Seema Sharma and there is me. Both of us have a bunch of uh, PhD students and many many interested undergrads who work with us. Primarily, what Seema and I do is we are mostly interested in searching for particles not described by the standard model. There are various moti- theoretical motivations for why you know there could be, for example, supersymmetric particles that exist. There could be particles that represent something called a type three seesaw mechanism. there could be vector like leptons which are not the traditional ones but which are slightly different so what we do in our research is we a help run the experiment collect the data try to improve the algorithms by which we can better identify these particles and then with the collected data try to look through the collected data to see if there is any evidence for any of these new particles being present in there and that is primarily what we do 
Most of the time we split our work halfway between analyzing the existing data and preparing for the future. So in terms of building better design detectors and having better designed algorithms so that the data that we collect remains of an extremely good quality. Apart from enhancing our understanding of matter, why should we explore particle physics? Particle physics requires significant investment from you know, the country in terms of funding, in terms of human manpower. You need a lot of smart people to work on this. One easy way to look at this is that if we would have never discovered the electron, we would not have electronics today. Now who knows that today if we discover some new kind of particle, what its uses may be tomorrow. So that is of course number one. The second thing is, particle physics just by its very nature requires us to be at the cutting edge of a lot of different technologies. For example, uh, as you may know, CERN was the place where the World Wide Web was born. So the information to be shared between scientists and the protocol by which this should be done, that is what WWW stands for. That was a fallout of uh, a large amount of research in particle physics. There are other medical benefits that come about by understanding how radiation interacts with bodies. So for example, things like understanding the fundamental properties of electrons and muons can help us when we decide to do say radiation therapy or you want to understand uh, or you want to build cyclotrons that help us to target cancer cells for example with specific kinds of radiation and how they interact with biological cells. So there are a lot of these fringe benefits that only happen if we spend considerable effort in trying to understand the fundamental properties of the world that we live in. Thank you Saurabh for addressing our curiosity so wonderfully. ICER Pune has done other videos about and around this topic. You can find them in the description box under the heading Particle Physics. Wish you a happy science day. Thank you.